Hey, good morning, everybody. So in the past, I've come to conferences and talked about all those gee whiz new features in the model, what's new, what's going on in terms of research. And as I get older, I can't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> I spend more and more of my time doing what you might consider maintenance. And you're going to hear some talks from some of the people we've been working with, collaborating with on some of the new features. But I really want to focus this morning on this term maintenance because it's in, in the world that I come from, it's somewhat of a dirty word. Uh, every year uh, at NIST, I and my collaborators are evaluated. And it's sort of like an academic evaluation. And we say that we spend a lot of our time doing software maintenance, model maintenance. And you know, my immediate supervisor says, don't say that word, maintenance. It's, it's, not, it's not like research. It's more like development. And development's bad, research is good. But the problem with that attitude is that over the past 30, 40 years, there have been a lot of models developed in FHIR. I've been in the field for 25 years. And I remember back when I started at NIST in 1991, there were dozens and dozens of different models under development. Most of them were what you would consider zone models. Um, a handful were more empirical correlations. And then CFD was just starting to come online. And there were about half a dozen of those starting up. Well, a couple years ago, actually more like 15 years ago, uh, the SFPE and a company in the United States called Combustion Science and Engineering decided to put together a survey. It's now an online survey. And what they did is they went around the world and they looked at all of the software that had been developed to do fire modeling, whether it be CFD models, zone models, evacuation models, what have you. And here's a, here's a page from the website, at least the last time I looked at it. And what you'll see here is the page for zone models. There are literally 50 plus models listed on this page, and only three of them, CFAST, Brandsfire from New Zealand, and there was one other from, from Denmark that I hadn't heard of, are still what we would consider supported or viable. And the rest of them are now considered legacy code. They still exist in some form or another. I suppose you can you know, write to the developer and maybe he or she will send you the source code. But you know, in my opinion, a lot of this software is basically dead. And I think that's a problem, because if you think about the intellectual talent that went into developing all these models, it's amazing. And of course, the money and resources, hundreds of millions of dollars, euros, yen, whatever you want to say, however you want to measure it, have been put into developing these models, which are now basically defunct. And, and if you talk to a lot of professors, they'll tell you, well, it's good to have lots of models. It's good for everybody to work in different ways. And then all the good ideas will naturally gravitate to the top. The cream will rise to the surface. I don't think that actually happens. I think a lot of these models simply end when either the funding runs out or the student graduates and gets a job or, or what have you. Any number of reasons these models just hit a dead end. The other thing about these models, like especially with zone models, they're all more or less the same thing. They're based on the same basic concepts. So that got me thinking about the work that we do at NIST. We maintain both FDS and CFAST. And I'm wondering, long term, how do we make sure that these models don't end up on the dead list? 
Because if they do end up on the dead list, it's hard to know what will replace them. Now, some people have said, well, you know, companies like Thunderhead Engineering will step in and maintain these models. But that's not realistic because the market just now think just in terms of business, the market for fire models is just not large enough. Okay? It's hard to go to uh, you know, a major software developer and get them interested in maintaining a piece of software that's going to sell, and you can, you can ask these guys how many licenses they sell. You know, they sell enough licenses to maintain a very small company. Right? Which means that Going forward, we have to think about a public-private partnership, much as, we are, much as we are seeing it develop today, by which government agencies, academia, and some private software developers work together to keep these models going. Now, the reason I, one, of the, one of the big reasons I, I came here, especially to Europe, is because I'm interested in, in forming that collaboration. A lot of people think that, oh, you know, FDS, it's great, you download it, you run it, and there are all these people who contribute to its development. Well, that's not really true. There is a lot of work going on, and every single day in our discussion group, I approve someone who writes you know, I'm using FDS for my master's thesis. And I think to myself, great, here's, here's one more person who can potentially help us. But the reality is, is that student writes a master's thesis and the work, you know, obviously gets published in a thesis, gets put onto the university's website. Maybe a paper is published, maybe not. And all of that work that the student does never actually ends up improving the model, improving the software. And so I'm once again making the call to all of those people out there who are, who are doing research work with not only FDS but with CFAST to work with us more closely. I think there's this there is this assumption that when you, you know, publish a thesis or publish a paper in a journal, that somehow magically that work, again, bubbles to the surface and eventually works its way into something like FDS and CFAST. Again, I don't think that's true. And, and let's use CFAST as an example. So, so CFAST has been around for longer than I've been in the field. It was developed in the 1980s amongst many other zone models. And once CFD came along, CFAST kind of was left to rot. That is, my management didn't feel it was worth pursuing. And there was one person left at, at NIST, his name is Rick Peacock, who about a quarter of his time was spent just making sure that CFAST would run, you know, as, as Windows continued to evolve, because CFAST typically runs on a Windows platform. And a few years ago, you know, we were contacted by the U.S. Department of Energy. We work a lot with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you know, and they told us that CFAST is far from dead. It's their primary workhorse. That is, th when they regulate nuclear power plants or uh, defense facilities or the Department of Energy has a lot of energy labs, they rely on CFAST for their day-to-day -day work, and yet here it was, we were letting CFAST go to rot. And so I decided to work with Rick over the past couple years and dig into the CFAST source code and clean it up and modernize it. And I, and I knew that Rick is in his mid-60s, so he's about to retire. And I thought to myself, well, what happens when Rick Peacock retires? Who is going to take this on? 
I mean, a lot of people just assume that you're always going to be able to go and download one of these models, and I'm worried about that going forward. Now, as Rick and I started to really dig into the routines that had not been touched in 20 years, I started to ask him, so, you know, this vent flow through a, hor you know, through a ceiling vent, where does this correlation come from? Oh, that's a paper that, you know, Len Cooper wrote about 30 years ago. It's written in some NIST report. I said, well, can you get me that NIST report? You come back a couple days later and say, nope, it's gone. <laughs> what do you mean it's gone? It's gone. We overhauled our library and that report somehow just fell through the cracks. So then I started digging into it myself, looking for papers and, and, and what have you. And what I found was a bit, a bit shocking because, you know, a lot of you here have been going to these fire conferences for years and you might just assume that the sort of these, these basic concepts of flow going through doors and, and hatches and, and so forth, the stuff that the, the, the basis of the zone models, that's so well known and well understood. And yes, it is well understood, well known, but when you actually go to code it up in a model and you have to make all these empirical correlations work together, there's a lot of stitching together of things that goes on and it was people like Rick Peacock, Paul Renick, Glenn Forney, who did all that. And so as I dug into the source code a little bit more, and I asked them, okay, so you've got the Heskestead plume, and you've got the Alpert ceiling jet, but the two things don't meet at the center line. What do you do there? And usually they would just say, oh, we just split the difference. I said, have we ever validated that? Is there any verification work for that? No. Has anyone really looked at that closely? No. Um, so that was a bit, a bit shocking to me, and, it, and, it, and it, it sort of dawned on me that we can't just let these models, you can't just code up one of these models and then just leave it alone. That these things require constant maintenance. Now, something like CFAST, you know, it may require just, you know, one or two people. Um, it's not a huge effort, but it has to be done. It has to be done by someone. And the thought comes to me is, hey, every day when I see these students, you know, applying for um, permission to use our discussion group, saying they're getting a master's degree in this, that, or the other thing, wouldn't it be great if we can have those students take another look at something like CFAST? What's the problem? Well, that's not sexy research. And a lot of people in academia say that this stuff is well known, it's done. This isn't new, and I can't publish papers based on this. But we really need, and especially master's degree students, we need them to look at these, you know, tried and true traditional fire protection engineering concepts that are embedded within CFAST. I mean, there are, there are very easy things that we can do to keep this software usable and up to date. In fact, for example, Glenn Forney has, you know, since he was the one who developed SmokeView that works with FDS, said, well, we'll put CFAST output into SmokeView as well so that one person, Glenn Forney, can maintain the graphical user interface for both of these models. In addition to that, we have an elaborate verification and validation process for FDS, which we now use for CFAST. So we're trying as much as we can at NIST to combine efforts to maintain both of these models. But again, going forward, we're gonna need more help from the community, and I suspect you know, it's going to come from the academic community because those of you here who are working for engineering firms, I understand completely that, you know, you've got your day-to-day -day business that you must attend to. But I know that a lot of you, you know, are thinking about maybe going back to school, getting a master's degree. And if so, definitely, if you're interested in modeling, 
get in contact with us, and I've got a list of 50 things that I can give you as potential topics for a master's thesis. Now, <clears throat> moving on to FDS, right now we have at NIST three people, myself, Randy McDermott, and Jason Floyd, who actually doesn't work at NIST, but he's one of our, our grantees, who are working on the day-to-day -day maintenance of the FDS source code. Now, there are several people we collaborate with who are doing what we would call new research. You'll hear from Marcus Vanella uh, today. Uh, Susan Killian uh, is here. She'll talk about some of the works that she's doing. But a lot of people are surprised to learn that the number of people who are actually working on the FDS source code is just two or three on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we have Glenn Forney, who's the visualization guy, and he also helps us with a lot of our, of our IT work. We're a very, very small group. And people sometimes say to me, well, Kevin, you know, you and all those FDS programmers should do this or should do that. And I'm like, where are these programmers? We, we don't have a lot. Um, NIST is much more like a university than you would think. It's a very academic environment. And in the academic environment, our management does not want to devote more than one or two people to any one particular area. You can imagine you're at, you're at a university, you have a department, and you have you know, a professor of X and a professor of Y and a professor of Z. And you typically don't have five, six, or a dozen people working in one, in one area. You want to diversify. And this has the same sort of attitude. So we struggle just to maintain the software. Now, Thunderhead Engineering has been a big help to us because, because of their efforts, we don't have to devote our energy to the graphical user interface, which is something that traditionally we've done terribly at. We're not very good at that kind of software development. So we do focus on just the core solver, and we understand that I don't believe that we can completely privatize the core development. I think we still need government support, whether it be from NIST or whether it be through academic grants, to, to maintain the software. So what I have on the screen here are some examples of how you in the audience might help us. These are just examples of some validation work that people have done at various universities around the world. And I've worked with them to get this work into our validation guide. And I spoke about this at the last conference, that for me, a lot of my day-to-day -day work is adding more and more examples to our verification and validation guides. And the reason for that is that in working with regulatory authorities like the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States, they really look for V and V or model certification evaluation. They have a number of different names for it, but we have to demonstrate that FDS can do what people are using it for. I often get calls from these regulators saying, you know, I've got a license application from a consulting firm and they're looking at, you know, LNG fires. Can FDS do LNG fires? And I say, mm, in theory, in theory it can, but I've never done it and we don't have any validation in our guide. Maybe there's a paper out there you can find, but that makes the regulators very nervous. They want proof that the model can do what the developers claim it can do. So we do, we, we do a lot of validation work. And so I'm just going to kind of run through a number of examples to plant the seed in your mind out there that if, you are, if you're doing validation work, if you're thinking of going back to school, this is the sort of thing you can do. 
I understand that many of you do not have backgrounds in mathematics or partial differential equations and that sort of thing. That's my background, and I'm more than happy to work on that sort of thing, but I don't have a background in fire protection engineer. I have absolutely no credibility in the field at all. I have no credentials, no degrees, no nothing. So I'm looking for working with the community to give me these examples, give me, you know, run the experiments, help me um, validate the model against those experiments so that then we can go to the regulatory authorities and say, look, here is evidence that the model can do what the developers claim it can do. And in the future, that's going to become more and more important. I think that up until now, um, showing the fire marshal a very sexy, pretty animation of smoke going through a building, which you can do with something like FDS, is sometimes enough to get you um, approval for your design. But I think that the authorities are going to get smarter, and pretty soon they're going to be asking harder questions like, you know, what's the basis or what's, what's your justification for, you know, that particular uh, heat release rate or that assumption about the boundary layer? You, you, you need to do a little bit more work to justify the model. And that's what these validation experiments do for us. So just, I'll just sort of snap through them. Um, there were some experiments done in New Zealand a few years ago by Rob Flurry, uh, supervised by Mike Spearpoint. Very simple. They just you know, set up a burner of various sizes, had some radiometers at various distances, and they were just measuring the heat flux. Because that often comes up. How well does FDS predict the heat flux from a fire. Seems pretty basic, but we actually did not, up until I found these experiments, have something so simple to work with. Here's something I worked on uh, just over the past six months. A student at the University of Ulster named Paul Tyson contacted me about some experiments that he was doing uh, validation work for. These experiments were done in Canada in a 10-story building where they had a big fire on the second floor and they were looking at smoke moving up the stairwell. And, you know, he asked me, can FDS do that? And I said, I don't know. We don't have any validation data for 10-story buildings. So, so he and I worked together and we got these experiments into our, um, into our validation guide. Now, ironically, uh, someone at NRC Canada, the agency that did the work, had already modeled this in FDS, unbeknownst to me. Um, I think I remember seeing a paper or going to a conference about it, but I had forgotten. So, so a lot of the work was done, and yet it wasn't captured. If I go to a regulatory authority and say, oh, here's a reference to a paper that was done 10 years ago showing FDS doing smoke movement in a stairwell, well, the question is, did they use the latest version of the code? And I'll say, well, no, of course not. They used the, the version from 10 years ago. So, well, how do you know that, that, that the latest version is going to work? So getting these examples rerun every time we do uh, a release is a big part of our day-to-day -day work. Here's some other uh, work that was uh, donated to us uh, by Simo Hostica, Topi Sikanen, and uh, Jonathan Walquist. Uh, and Jonathan was working at, was he at Lund? Yeah. And, and the PRISMI experiments were done in France by the nuclear authorities there to look at fires within nuclear power plants. Okay. These were actually fairly straightforward experiments, but they were done in a facility that had a an elaborate ventilation system. And we did not have anything in our guide, you know, to demonstrate that the ventilation routines in FDS actually work. We did some verification work, but we didn't have any validation work. So Topi and, and Jonathan and Simo, you know, put together these experiments and we put them into our guide. Um, Recently in Sweden, Ulf uh, Wikström and a number of his students have been doing very, very simple experiments 
of big fires in small compartments, looking at flashover effects. Uh, as many of you who know Ulf, he's a big proponent of the plate thermometer. So he instrumented this compartment with plate thermometers and it's great validation data for us. So he worked with, with me to get these into our guide. Um, here's another set of experiments that were done in New Zealand by Roger Harris, again with Mike Spearpoint, um, looking at just spill plumes, just smoke pouring out of a compartment. And they were trying to develop a correlation, much like the, the standard plume correlation for a spill plume. Now, now what's funny about these exercises is that Mike Spearpoint just happened to be visiting us at NIST for a couple of weeks, and he just happened to mention these experiments. So unfortunately, when these experiments were being done, you know, I didn't know about it. So what I, had, what I ended up doing is essentially repeating all of the modeling work that the students had done and then putting it into the validation guide. And that's, that's a bit of a time-consuming process, and the shame of it is that someone had already done it, and yet the student had you know, graduated and moved on and really was not in any position to help me, so I had to you know, essentially redo their master's thesis. So that's why I'm, I'm looking for people who are embarking on the master's thesis to, to contact us so that then we can work together within the framework of our, of our verification and validation guides to get this stuff in. <coughs> this was some work done several years ago um, by Arab Fire, just relatively simple experiments done in a tunnel. And again, this is, this is a case where we had up to that point nothing to demonstrate that we could, you know, model a, a fire in a tunnel. Of course, you know, in theory, FDS should be able to do something like this, but without the validation, you know, the regulatory authorities are not impressed with us just saying, well, theoretically it can work. So all of this validation work, you know, eventually works its way into our guides. And again, this is what I spend almost 90% of my time on, okay? I leave it to the younger people to develop the new stuff. I'm more interested in the long-term maintenance. And to me, long-term maintenance is not just maintaining the source code, but it's developing these verification and validation cases that will justify the use of the model. So that when, when you use the model for whatever purpose you have, you'll be able to point to these guides and say, yes, you know, FDS has been shown to predict the heat flux from this kind of fire to within this percent of accuracy. So what you see here, and I showed this, this type of plot, I recall the last time I spoke at this meeting, where we, in this case, we're looking at FDS predictions of surface temperature, and we have measurements on this line and predictions on this line. And then we have here all of the different experimental test series that we're extracting data from. And my goal is to fill in this chart with as many points as possible and to cover the range. So we're talking about temperatures ranging from above 1,000 degrees C, like in a flashover compartment, all the way down here to 10 to the zero, which I, as I recall is one, 10 to the first is 10. So here we have cases where we are predicting temperature rises of just a few degrees, say in a compartment that's remote from the compartment that has the fire. This is a very nice way to present the results to regulatory authorities because you can see that we are most inaccurate, ironically, in the low end. And I see this with a lot of our validation work that it's actually easier to predict the temperature of a flashed over compartment than it is to predict the temperature of the wall 
you know, down low in some adjacent room to where the fire is located. Okay? And that's, that's useful information because if, if the regulatory authority doesn't really care about that, but rather cares about, you know, the structural integrity of the building, okay, then you can point to this part of the chart. But I think this is, a, this is going forward, you know, one of the most valuable components of FDS, to have charts like this that you can show to the authorities, in addition to the fact that, that we're constantly, you know, updating the source code, maintaining things, doing our daily uh, continuous integration testing, and so forth. It's, some of this work can be tedious, but what I'm saying to you is, if you're going to be doing a master's or PhD thesis anyway, you know, help us with some of the tedious work. In other words, don't just leave it to someone like me to do the work after you've graduated, because that's often what happens, is someone graduates and then they, they email me the thesis and say, here, you can put this in FDS, as if you can kind of ram, you know, a 200-page thesis into the model. It doesn't work that way. In addition, though, to getting in touch with us early, we can give you a lot of ideas about interesting topics. I think we find that I get a lot of papers to review at NIST. Every couple of weeks, I get a paper to review from a journal that's FDS related. And oftentimes, the what's being simulated is something that we're really not having trouble with. In other words, the student really hasn't identified a problem to be solved. They're just sort of going through the motions and downloading the model and running some cases and then publishing a paper. If you contact us early, we can say, you know what? We're having real problems with you know, X, Y, or Z. In fact, all of these case studies that I showed you when I went to do them myself, I identified a number of problems with each one that then led me to do a little bit of research on my own to fix or improve those problems. So you as a student, if you come to me and say, hey, I want to model these experiments that were done, I'll say, yeah, we can model about 90% of it, but where you're going to have problems is, bah, like if, I, if you go back to here, you know, when I got to talking to Paul more and more, you know, he told me that when they, when they did these experiments in this high-rise building in Canada, they didn't measure the leakage rates in the building. And so when we were doing the FDS model, we made up the leakage rates, and we just got some leakage rates from, I think, the NFPA handbook. And lo and behold, we noticed dramatic different answers depending on the leakage rates. In particular, you know, temperatures near the top of the stairwell depended greatly on the leakage rates in the floors, in the upper floors. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? If, if these floors are really tight, then smoke going up the stairwell is going to be impeded. Whereas if there's a window open up here, then you're going to have a uniform flow going right up the stairs, bringing higher temperatures in there. So 90% so of the work that Paul was doing is fairly routine. Just, you know, setting up the building, um, you know, reading the test reports, you know, on and on and on. But it was that 5%, that leakage rate problem, that was, the real, that was the real crux of the matter. And he and I, you know, exchanged emails over a number of weeks looking at that issue. And that led me to start looking more and more at, you know, leakage rates in high-rise buildings. So, so our model development is really driven by these test cases. So 
I think I've used up an appropriate amount of extra time. <laughs> so I will, I will leave it there again with, with one more appeal to those of you who are interested in working with us. Do not assume that the FDS development team or the CFAS development team, that we are some army of people and that you could never possibly contribute. We are a very small group of people and even at the master's level, you can definitely contribute because I guarantee you, take a look at any new fire scenario that we don't have in one of our guides and you will very quickly come across a problem that needs to be worked on because Yes, some of these cases, there's, some, there's a routine part of it, but I guarantee you, every single experiment that's conducted, there is some, there's some aspect to it that requires another look. And it's not until an end user comes to us and says, hey, you know, I'm getting these really weird results here that we look at it. Because we, we generally don't just I mean, work on things that users don't care about. We like to work on things that are relevant. So we know that when you look at a new set of experiments, you're going to bring a new problem to us that we're going to be concerned with, and that's going to be a problem that you can also work on as part of your studies. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so we have some time just for a few questions. If anybody has a question, raise your hand, please, and we'll pass the mic. Any questions for Kevin? <laughs> Now's the time to ask. You can't talk to him at break. So, yeah. oh, there you go. That's I'm Charlie. leaving after this. That's right. <laughs> um, thanks, Kevin. I mean, it's interesting to hear this. My question to you, yeah. in turn, if you go through the validation guide, yep. and I understand why all of your measurements are at steady state. Right. But from a fire engineering point of view, we use this all the time on a transient problem. Visibility right. fails in, temperature criteria, whatever it yep. is. Yep. Is there any plan to move into this transient problem? I mean, you know, the, the big one is the layer height, how quickly it comes down. And you've avoided that. I understand there's all sorts right. of things with turning your results from, you know, a CFD into a, quote, layer and all those right. sorts of things. Right, right. I mean, we don't have any policy for steady state. Um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons we often like steady state is because, as the, as the chart here attests to, um, at, for every single measurement, there needs to be um, a way to compare the model with the with the experiment. So for example, if you've got a thermocouple, all right, and you run the compartment to steady state, then you can compare directly that steady state thermocouple temperature with the steady state model prediction. If you're looking at a transient, it's hard to compare, mm. right? So that's, so that's one of the reasons we tend to focus on, on steady state. Um, it's just simply the metrics. And the metrics of, of, of success or failure have been given to us by the regulatory authority. So when we work with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, what they say to us is, we just want to know how well does the model predict the peak temperature compared to the actual measured peak temperature. So that's, that has driven us a lot towards looking at steady state scenarios because that's what the regulators are concerned with. They know that whatever fire is going to occur, say in a nuclear power plant, um, I mean the transient part is less of an issue for them. It's more when the fire hits its steady state, how hot is it going to be? And is it going to be below sort of our you know, threshold of comfort? So we've just focused on, on the steady state for ease and it's sort of what the, what the regulators are asking of us, but there's nothing there's no reason why we can't look at um, time dependent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a more difficult problem, both in terms of how you compare it and everything yes. else. Another yes. comment I'll just make about your low end temperatures. Yep. If you want to capture those, forget a thermocouple. You'll have to go to something like a thermistor 
in okay. order to get that because it, that's very hard to get and your error there right. is within what I mean you got that much noise on a thermocouple right. well, at that end. Well that's the problem. These these experiments typically aren't ours. Yeah. We we so <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. We <laughs> have to take <laughs> what we get. And if you look at a lot of our um, experiments that we've looked at over the years, um, <sighs> There's, 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 rarely is there any kind of uncertainty analysis. Um, sometimes we question, you know, certain measurements, but if that's what we have, that's what we have. Luckily though, with more and more points on this plot, the outliers don't mean as much. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we emphasize more and more data because sometimes if you just focus on one set of experiments, and, and, and let's say in the experiments they use TCs rather than thermistors, then it might appear that the model is completely wrong because of that one type of measurement. So we like to get a lot of different points from a lot of different experiments to compare with. On this chart, actually, I just want to understand the scale you have on here. Does that make the lower end of your chart more out of, out, of, out of tolerance compared to the higher end of the chart just because of the scale you are using on your chart on here? So <clears throat> the way we make comparisons is on a relative basis, okay? And when you are, so we'll, so we'll, tep we'll typically compare the measured temperature rise against the predicted temperature rise on a relative basis. So if, if the temperature of the wall only increases by 10 degrees and we predict 15, well, that's a 50% error and it's gonna fall way outside of our bounds. So that's why we tend to see a lot more scatter in the results at the low end. But still, as an absolute values on the higher end of your chart, it is massive difference. But if you take it as a percentage, you're right. It will fail on, onto your line. Yes. But if you take it as absolute values, it could be 100 degrees or a few hundred degrees actually off the chart. Right, right, right. But we've just chosen the, the relative difference is something that we find um, to be most convenient. So when regulatory authorities ask us, how good is FDS at predicting, you know, this particular like surface temperature? Well, we'll say plus or minus 10% or 20%. We always express uncertainty as a percentage rather than as an absolute. The other thing, because I did experiments and validation due my PhD, but on the other hand, to do accurate experiment, it is just a challenge by itself. So how do you verify the data you get from this experiment, and when you when you run your models compared to this experiment, it's always hard just to yeah. make sure that your boundary condition is reflecting what they did on on their experiment. It's it's a challenge, and often that's why you know we like to work with the people doing the experiments. Almost all of the experiments that I have in the validation guide, I've spoken to the person doing the experiment, um, and they always tell me that. They tell me lots of things that aren't actually written in the test report. <laughs> um, but still, I have to, at the end of the day, trust that the experiments were done well. And if they're not, if there's something systematically wrong with the way the measurements are made, I typically see it show up here. So sometimes we'll see, we'll look at it, we'll look at, say, oxygen concentration and a number of different types of experiments. And if we see, you know, for, most of the experiments were within 10% of the measured value, but then for another set of experiments, we're off by 50%, then we start to question that. Um, but it's hard to just simply, you know, read a paper or get a test report and, and toss it out because, I mean, it, it appears that they've done all the, that they've done the, the measurements carefully, but there's really, I don't know, is there an independent way to confirm, you know, that experiments and measurements are being done properly? It's, that's a challenge. So usually it's just a matter of talking to, you know, the supervisor, the students, 
reading the test report. Sometimes in reading the test report, I mean, you can see if there's a lot of care taken in describing what they did and how they calibrated the instruments and that sort of thing. That does increase our level of confidence, but at the end of the day, we, we just have to trust the results. There's no independent stamp of approval. And peer review doesn't, sometimes people say, well, I published my results in a peer review journal. I, that doesn't mean much because how can a reviewer look at someone's set of experiments and really, unless there's some obvious mistake, it's really hard to know whether or not the technician on that particular day woke up on the wrong side of the bed and just didn't calibrate the instrument properly. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kevin.